So we had a lot of questions along the way, but there might be an, a few more. If any politician would just stand up and say, you know, this is what we've got to do. Uh, the, the system selects for, mm, in my harsher moments, I would say sociopaths. But in my kinder moments, I would say the system selects for people who can't possibly tell the truth. Because that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear that we'll have economic growth forever with no consequences. Or only positive consequences. It's always morning in America. Do you spell that with a U in the word morning? Because that's how I spell it. Who does not have children? It's the nine-year-old doesn't belong No, the nine-year-old does not belong to me. I, I, I'm not sure he... I'm not sure who he belongs to. He's in charge. We belong to him, really. <laughs> but no, I don't have children. And neither does my wife. Who I occasionally refer to as my first wife. That offends her every time. <laughs> so did you study biodynamics? Or, or anything, you know, um, we, we adhere to the principles of permaculture on this property. So we have, for example, six sources of water because that's fairly important, especially if you live on a rock pile in the desert. Um, I integrated the principles of permaculture into some of my classes when I was teaching at the university. I was teaching in a school of natural resources and the environment, and I called myself a conservation biologist. Um, but conservation biology didn't exist as an enterprise until after I received my PhD, so I don't have any formal education in conservation biology as I don't have any formal education in a lot of the things that I did later in my career, like, for example, teaching poetry in prisons, which is how I spent the last several years at the University of Arizona. Once I was banned from teaching in my home department, that left me with honored students and inmates as the target audiences. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I spent my time. The biodynamics got any traction in, in America? Well, yes. I mean, Jevons is a big proponent. He lives in Mendocino County, California, uh, of the biointensive growing method. Um, so, yes, there's a there's a big following. There's a big following for permaculture, but it varies wildly from region to region in the country. So, in the Upper Midwest, where economic collapse happened a long time ago and is nearly complete, people are really, really interested in permaculture because they're interested in eating. People are funny that way. In many places, uh, the places that are still financially wealthy, the people will not understand that economic collapse can happen to them until after it's over. So people in those places are not interested in permaculture. In places like Tucson, Arizona, you really can't make that happen anyway. Not at scale. I mean, a few hundred people lived there up until the 1600s when they discovered white people. And, but at the time, there were two perennial rivers that flowed in Tucson. And now the water table is 800 feet down because we put too many straws in the ground and started sucking all that water out of there. So at scale, there's a whole bunch of stuff like permaculture that just doesn't work. And where it does work, it's being applied uh, at probably too, too small a level at this point. How do you pump the water out of the ground? What's your password? solar, PV solar panels, and, and a hand pump. So we have, we have two wells, each of which has a solar pump down it, and we have a hand pump that runs side by side with one of the solar panels. We harvest rainwater off two roofs, and the perennial river, which worked just fine for the first 10 or 12,000 years people were there, is about a quarter mile away. Yes. I feel like you're you know, beginning the series of scary you know, predictions. Um, you like the scary predictions? You grew up on horror movies, didn't you? It's your whole generation. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's very important. I think it's something I'm talking about. I, I was satisfied. I wonder what the, uh, I'm sure you know this, I wonder what you think about the difference between this you know, particular crisis and the CFC convention. You know, why was that? As I said, why did the world leader? care about CFC, not this. Well, well, I think a couple of reasons. One, it was personal. Right? Ronald Reagan demonstrated no interest whatsoever in controlling CFCs until he got a mole on his nose. 
and it was attributed to UV radiation. And he goes, skin cancer? Oh, we should do something about that. I'm not suggesting we give cancer to every politician. <laughs> I set him up and you knock him down. This is working great. The other thing was that was a there was a relatively easily employed political solution to that problem. By the way, the ozone hole continued to grow for another 30 years after that fix was implemented, but there was an there was an easily and readily available substitute for Freon for for the for the source of the problem. So it didn't crimp the industrial economy by going down that road. Dealing with global climate change is going to seriously crimp the industrial economy because it requires complete economic collapse to save the habitat for our species. I'm guessing most people are not going to run on that campaign. Right, so I'm running for prime minister. Is that even a running kind of thing? Is that a political office? Where you, okay. I don't know how it works in more civilized countries than mine. Yes, I foresee a gift economy, which is how we spend the first two million years of the human experience. Uh, I foresee in some places, like the little valley I occupy, agrarian anarchy. We'll see. Uh, again, we don't know the future, but we get to make the future. So we're trying to make the future in advance. Y you want to you want to beat collapse before it comes to you, before it comes to your neighborhood. You want to get there first, right? So that you can stake your claim on collapse. I was here first. This collapse is mine. So we're going to do it this way, a, a, a sort of rational, ethical way to approach it. Exactly. Right there, and then you. You right there. Oh, yeah. Um, it's not a question, it's just really a comment. Because um, I stumbled across your blog several years ago, um, and the title was quite apt. Um, and your writing at the time was all around nature batting last. Mm -hmm. sort of, it's a very useful frame for me because um, I am one of those local body politicians. <laughs> so I get presented with projects and various things from officers about various things. And um, it has been useful to be able to say to officers that nature. That's last. Mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. reconsider your project or reconsider your approach. Um, and so they, got, they kind of scratch their head, you know, you know, you know trying to wonder what I'm talking about. But I about well, well, it's a baseball, it's a baseball analogy, which doesn't work in cricket apparently. In baseball, the home team always bats last. Oh, I don't know anything about sports at all. So I don't see it as a sports. Oh, okay. Analogy. Okay. Not at all. So. Um, but it's in terms of, like, for example, um, climate change. Um, mm -hmm. We are facing um, sea level sea level rise. So the question I ask officers is, when they're spending projects, sea level rise. Is it even like sea level rise? That's things like that. So right, and and five degrees C sea level rise translates to well, five degrees C melts all of the world's ice, all of it. That's 250 foot sea level rise, 70 meters or so. Um, just for your information, the officers are actually acknowledging sea level rise mm -hmm. a bit. Um, and so, for instance, along Tempe Drive, several hundred thousand extra has been spent on um, anticipating the sea level rise. Mm -hmm. um, Excellent. But that's just a short portion. It's mm -hmm. right along the coast. The, the state of North Carolina in the United States just just banned sea level rise. They, they legislatively said we don't have climate change in North Carolina because we don't so we can't tolerate sea level rise. So that's the United States way to approach it. Exactly, yes, yes. I'm sure the Supreme Court will uphold it as well. Mm, right there. Um, can you tell us about your aha uh, moment? <laughs> In August of 1979, I reached several conclusions about the dire state of our affairs. One aha moment came, I was a, I was a helitech crew member, so I would fly in a helicopter, oh, the irony is not lost on me, fly in a helicopter to put out a fire and, or drive a truck. And the call came in one day and everybody else has gone to lunch, so I drove the truck to the fire. And I got to the fire and I went, 
wow, me and my truck aren't going to do this one. It was a big fire. And in fact, there was no way to put it out with any human endeavors. And I realized that as soon as I saw it. So it hit me like a ton of bricks. There are some, some forces that are beyond human ability to manage or to even deal with. And because I had an undergraduate education that focused on limits to growth in a time when we actually talked about limits to growth in the wake of the Club of Rome's 1972 report by the same name, I recognized that there are limits to growth that actually apply to the human population too. That, that it's not just yeast. It's every organism overshoots and then collapses. So I had a series of aha moments. Um, the one was in the summer of 79, and then after that they came more gradually, I guess, uh, through my undergraduate education and graduate education and so on. And so I was writing about global peak oil in 2002, 2003, when I was working on a book. Um, so it's been, it's been a relatively long, torturous path. Not so much a single crystalline moment. Well, it depends, which is always the answer to any ecological question. It depends. It depends on how it plays out. If there's a sudden termination of water supply and electricity to cities, 84% you know, of the people in the United States live in cities now, according to the 2010 census. 84%. Of those 84%, something less than 1% have the slightest clue what's going on in the world because they watch television. <laughs> How would you know anything? And so they don't know anything. So when the water stops coming through the tap, I suspect at least 99% of the 84% of the people in that country who live in cities will just wait for the water to come back on because it always has before. And they'll wait four or five days and then they won't be waiting anymore. So will there be marauding hordes that show up at our property or in that valley where several people are making other arrangements? It would kind of surprise me actually. We're a long way from anywhere. Marauding hordes require organization. And, and the people who would be marauding are not the kind of people who can organize a sack lunch, much less a, a horde of people to come in and army-like take over the valley. But you can do a lot of damage with several people on horses with guns. Okay, so if there's several people who show up with guns, they can do a couple of things. They can shoot us, in which case they just destroyed their only source of food because <laughs> they don't know how to grow it. right? They don't know how anything works. So that's not really a very good long-term solution for either of us because we're dead, and they soon will be. Um, they could enslave us, I suppose. There are some futures I don't want to live through, and, and you're bringing up some of them. <laughs> if, we, if we turn into Mad Max, you know, I've had 52 pretty decent years, all things considered. I know, but I, I wouldn't that because that's what concerns a lot of people about. Right, yeah. right. So, and, and, and people also are, are concerned about uh, human suffering to come, as if we don't have a lot of that already. Look in every non-industrialized country in the world, where we're, which we're oppressing at the point of a gun. We have plenty of that in industrialized countries, human suffering. And we don't pay any attention to that, for the most part. So, am I worried about the human suffering to come? Yes, I'm worried about human suffering now. A am I worried about suffering at a larger level? Like, say, 200 species a day being driven to extinction? I'm kind of concerned about that, yes. There are a lot of these things over which I don't have any control at all. And so I'm trying to control the things I can control while looking forward to a better future than our recent past. Will it work? Maybe. You can only do what you can do. And if it doesn't work, well, as John Maynard Keynes, the economist, said, in the long run, we're all dead. Mm -hmm. Now, just maybe one or two more questions, and we'll wrap it up. We've got a big drive in front of us. Does the warning you're getting from 
below the ground? Not in any way we can measure. So, so you can do it straight? Oh yes. Okay. Straight out of the ground. And and we do. And and we have the ultimate biological test. We have the nine year old. It's all he's ever drank. And he's more or less normal. <laughs> <laughs> on that and note, thanks very much for coming along. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Back on. And, uh,